Okay, so today we're going to be looking at the cloud storage system or a file sharing system. So a cloud storage system is basically an online platform that allows users to store, share and collaborate on files and documents over the internet. And so obviously the two most popular and well-known ones would be Google Drive and Dropbox. So if we jump into the requirements, we've got our functional requirements where we need to be able to, uh, to have file upload and download capabilities. And then we also need to be able to sync files across multiple users and devices. And then for the non-functional requirements, we want it to be highly scalable and highly reliable. It's also important to note that real-time collaboration will not be discussed uh, in this video. And so for our estimates, we've got a storage estimate. So here are daily active users. We're gonna assume it's 500 million. So 500 by 10 to the six. The number of files uploaded be one file per user per day. And then we can assume that the average file size is 150 uh, kilobytes, which is roughly 15 by 10 to the four bytes. Uh, and then for the daily storage, we want to get our users. So 500 million users, multiply that by our 150 kilobytes, and that'll give us roughly 7.5 by 10 to 13 bytes. So if you remember your exponents, you know we can add the four and the six to give us 10, and then 15 times 500 is 7,500, divide that by 1,000, uh, and that'll give us 7.5 and then obviously add three to our exponent, which will give us 10 to the 13. And then for the yearly storage requirements, we just multiply that uh, by 365. And in this case, we get two by seven uh, by 10 to the 16 bytes, which is roughly equal to kind of 27 petabytes. And then if we assume we're storing for 10 years, then we just multiply that by 10. And then we've got a total storage of roughly 270 petabytes. So a lot of data to store here. And then in terms of queries per second, well, if we've got 500 million users, they upload once a day, we can then divide that by 24 uh, hours, 60 minutes, and then divide by 60 seconds, which gives us a roughly uh, QPS of 6,000. So again, quite a high QPS as well. And so before jumping into the API design, there's kind of a core problem you have to address first. Uh, and so what I'm showing you here isn't, isn't the actual architecture, it's just for demonstration purposes. So let's say, for example, we're working on a, a large file, say a two gig file. And let's say we simply just add a character to the end of it. Well, what we'll have to do is we'll have to send over that entire file to some arbitrary web servers. And then those web servers will then have to store that file um, you know, in a content storage, so something like AWS S3. And so that's quite a lot of storage just for you know one tiny file change. And then if we think, you know, if we've got, you know, kind of like in Google Drive, we've got shared drives. Well, if we've got some kind of shared workspace, we're then gonna have to send um, that information uh, those two gigs to all of the other people in that workspace. And so as you can see here, uh, having looked at our estimates, that's not gonna scale well at all. And it's gonna become a massive bottleneck. So to solve that problem, what we can do is we can introduce this concept of creating blocks. So it's breaking down our objects or our files into these blocks. And so four megabytes is a pretty reasonable size. And so this means when I make a change, I can then send over four megabytes to the web servers. They can then store those changes and then those changes are also broadcast to users. But obviously the big benefit here is we are sending across a lot less data and we're also storing a lot less data but it does introduce complexities in terms of you know, the reconstruction of blocks into their original files, but we'll discuss that in the uh, architecture overview. So if we look at our database schema, again, this is a really bare bones uh, schema. We're not going deep at all. Uh, this is just kind of the core tables you might want to have. And again, you can always build it out and add on more tables if you want. So we've got a user object here, user ID, a name, a created us. Um, and we obviously have devices, a one-to-many relationship here where a user can have many devices and a device belongs to, to one user. And then similarly, we also have our team space here to similar to shared drive. It's got an ID, a name, and it created that. And then this user team space uh, table here uh, kind of facilitates that many-to-many -many relationship with the users and the team spaces. Uh, and then similarly, we've got our object here. So this will represent our file. So we've got an ID, a name. We've also got a latest history number. So to support versioning, we have this object history which is basically an object at a point in time. And so it's got an ID. It's got that reference to the object ID uh, and then we also have the device ID, okay, one-to-many one relationship there. And then we also have the history number. And so that, that's where, where we know where in the file history this kind of object belongs. Uh, and so looking at it here, we've got the latest history number on the object. So we always know where the latest uh, object is. And last, edited and created that. And then similarly here, we've also got our block, uh, a one-to-many relationship here, whereby you know an object history is made up of several blocks, but a block can only belong to one object history. And we also have the block position, such that when we're rebuilding our objects, we know exactly which position to uh, put the block in. Okay, so now jumping into our architecture overview. So our client is gonna be responsible for a kind of a multitude of functionality. So the first one is the monitor. So the monitor kind of all it does is it monitors for changes in the files in the local workspace, and it will then notify uh, the Blockify service. And so the whole point of the Blockify is obviously to split the file into smaller blocks. 
um, and it's also responsible for reconstructing those blocks um, later on. And then once that's happened, once you've broken down, we can then notify the synchronizer and the role of the synch synchronizer is to relay these changes to the client database, as well as the metadata service, which I'll discuss in a bit. So the client database is basically it locally stores information about the shared space, the block, maybe the hash of the object and the object history. Uh, it's, you know, it should be easy to implement and you can do it with something like a lightweight database like SQL Lite. So basically it's focuses on managing the file state locally on the client side and it's tailored for individual clients. So obviously we've got a load balancer to distribute our traffic, but then we've also got all these additional services. So we could have a user service, an analytic service, an alt service. So these are services that are kind of adjacent to the core problem, obviously very important to have, but they're not the core problem. So I won't discuss them here, but if you feel in your interview, you do definitely go ahead and uh, discuss those as well. So then we have our block service. So what this does is, so we've already broken down our uh, uh, our files into blocks. And so the main job of the block service is to then store uh, those blocks in the content storage. But if we want to reduce storage costs and maybe improve security, we could also implement compression and encryption here. So for compression, we could have Huffman coding and arithmetic uh, co uh, coding, but it's important to note that, you know, Google and Dropbox would have their own, you know, propriety compression algorithms as well. And then for encryption, we could use, you know, something like 256 bit advanced encryption standard and then to further reduce storage costs we could implement cold storage like AWS uh, S3 Glacier and so the policy to determine when to place uh, objects in cold storage uh, is very important and so we could use maybe our analytic service there to do an analysis um, and say maybe last time since file was open and we could know then at a particular point in time we can be very confident knowing that if it hasn't been opened for a particular amount of time that it should be placed in cold storage. Uh, then we also have our metadata service. And so this is kind of concerned with the global state of files across the system and facilitating synchronization and design to handle the complexities of a, a multi-client system. And so the information that gets sent here is all about the shared space, the blocks, the hashes of the objects, you know, the object history, all that, uh, all that stuff relating to the actual information about you know, the block. And so you know, having a cache here would be a very good idea. So something like Redis or Memcache. Um, and so what we could do is to try and store you know, either recent or frequently accessed objects and so your choice of eviction policy here is very important as getting this right could significantly reduce the, the load on our databases. So then obviously we'll have a database as well. Uh, and so our choice of uh, reliability is probably key here. And so I think if we're looking at our cap theorem trade-off. I think maybe uh, an SQL database would be very good you know, to have those ACID properties. So something like MySQL or Postgres would be good here. Now you could argue that a NoSQL database could work, uh, you know, if you increase the replication factor to improve consistency, you know, but that would come at the cost of increased storage requirements as well as network traffic. So as always, you know, system design, it's all about trade-offs. So being able to discuss both, you know, the pros and cons of each, you know, will uh, look good in your interview. And so we obviously saw in the estimates that we're dealing with massive scale. And so maybe sharding might be a good option here to distribute the load. So what this will involve is obviously partitioning the database into smaller, more manageable pieces called shard. And then each of which would then be stored on different servers. And this strategy is used to kind of uh, introduce horizontal scaling and allows us to handle you know more data and traffic by distributing the load across uh, those servers. Uh, and so here, I think key things to note would be the shard key selection. So we'd want to choose a, an appropriate shard key in here. Maybe we'd want to take a, a hash of the file name or the object ID and then use that as the shard key. And then also maybe you want to dive deep and discuss the sharding strategy. So you could have um, range-based sharding, hash-based sharding, or list-based sharding. And so for us, I think you know hash, uh, hash function being applied to the shard key uh, could be an appropriate solution here. And this would obviously help ensure a balanced load distribution to improve the overall uh, query performance. And then for our consistency and replication, you know, to ensure we've got high availability and data durability, uh, you know, we could have each shard then replicated across multiple servers. You know, this obviously adds another layer of complexity. So it's, it's worth noting that um, to our shard management, but it's also essential for fault tolerance. And that being said, we could also use our analytic service to maybe do some analysis on where our customers are located and then locate our service and data centers that are near our customers to, again, improve, improve the overall performance. Uh, and then the metadata service would also be responsible for pushing messages onto queues. And so for in each workspace, you typically have several users. And so what you could do there is push a message onto each queue for each user in the workspace once someone made a change in that workspace. And so this could be implemented with something like Kafka. And then we've also got our notification service. So the role of the notification service is to fill, facilitate clients being able to be updated when changes have been made to a, a file they are connected to. And so as mentioned previously, the last role of the synchronizer is to listen to changes uh, in the notification service. And so how we go about doing that is also an interesting conversation. So let's say we've got a workspace that's got clients A, B, and C. You know, they all want to receive updates whenever changes are made by other 
uh, other users. So we could use a persistent you know, WebSocket connection. So changes are instantly uh, get broadcast. However, WebSockets are typically for bi-directional communication. So they'd be perfect for a chat app like WhatsApp. However, in our case, we're only sending uh, information is only getting sent in one direction. Our clients are never sending information to the notification service. Uh, and so in that way, I, I don't think WebSockets are a great solution. We could look at short polling. So short polling is where the client periodically sends a request, polls uh, the service for new data at regular intervals, but it's typically not the recommended approach. What I would go for is maybe long polling. So in this case, the server holds the request open. So the client will make a request. The server holds it open so it hangs until either new data is available or a timeout occurs. So once the client then receives the new data or a timeout occurs, it will then immediately send another request to then um, reopen that connection. And then this process repeats. So it kind of, it creates a near real time effect, but it does have the overhead of re repeatedly establishing, uh, you know, HTTP connections. So hopefully this architecture overview kind of helped things out. What we'll do now is jump into the workflow and hopefully this will kind of clear things up and understand how the upload and download process works exactly. So. Step number one, we've got a user making uh, uh, changes to their file, which is then picked up by the monitor. The block of ICE service then converts those into uh, blocks. And then the synchrovisor then first sends it off to the block service. The block service then compresses and encrypts it and then stores it in the content storage. Then it also stores the meta, goes reaches out to the metadata service, which will then store the metadata uh, information in both the cache or the uh, database or both. And then the metadata service will then send that information onto the relevant queues. So now that the message is on the queue, let's say client B establishes a long polling connection with the notification service. It will then receive that message. So the synchronizer will be looking for that message. It will then see, okay, we need to get more data. So what it will do then, it will then reach out uh, to the metadata service to get the metadata information about the missing blocks. And then finally, it'll reach out to the block service, which will go into the content storage and then return that to the client so that it has now downloaded the blocks that were previously changed by uh, client A. And so that's the overall workflow. Hopefully that clears things up with the upload and download flow. And you've kind of got a nice visual representation of, of what's happening. And so finally, so for some additional discussion points, you know, we've obviously discussed, you know, reducing storage costs with cold storage. So the important thing here is determining, you know, when the content gets moved into cold storage as we don't want to be retrieving data from here. Uh, we could also reduce storage costs by removing duplicate objects. So we could um, uh, get a hash of the contents of the blocks. And then if we see an identical hash uh, already exists, then we don't have to store that data. And so we could just update the metadata information pointing to that existing block. Again, compression, if you know your Hoffman encoding or arithmetic coding, you could go really deep there. And similar for encryption, you could discuss more about the 256-bit uh, advanced encryption standard. And then obviously we could go for a, a multi-data center approach whereby we've run an analytics to know where our users are and then appropriately locate our uh, servers near those people. And then obviously our additional services. So one example of this could be using our analytics service to then uh, run some analysis on typical usage patterns, and then we could optimize our resources during those times to improve the overall robustness of the system. So hopefully this video helped, a lot of effort goes into it. So if you could like and subscribe, that would be greatly appreciated. And then for anyone studying for technical interview, check out techprep.app. It's got all your system design, data structures, and algorithms, and theory coding questions. And I will see you in the next one.